this Sunday morning at 9 a.m. from our kitchen as we stream uh, live our time uh, together. Thanks for joining us. Remember, as always, we love your comments. They're so encouraging and so helpful to us. So be sure to uh, comment anytime uh, throughout uh, our broadcast uh, together. We'd be honored if you, if, you, uh, if you did that. Let me go on and encourage you to grab your Bible. If you don't have it beside you right now, we'll be looking at Psalm 70, 73 in just a few minutes. So go ahead and grab that so it'll be uh, nearby. Before we get started this morning, I want to make a few comments about some photos that have been posted. First of all, Len and I want you to know we don't post anything. Neither one of us even know how to do that. So I'm going to blame Patty. I'm going to give you her last name. Patty's kind of the uh, administrator for the journey class. And uh, she uh, is always asking us for some photos. So we got into kind of the family album and, and, uh, and looked back. And uh, you saw, I think, a first grade picture of, of me. First grade picture of me, you may remember. And then there was, I think this is a second grade picture of, of Linda. Now, what struck me, and then, of course, the one that was most popular was our engagement picture with Jimmy and the cool glasses and the plaid pants. I think what struck me most is uh, some of you said, y'all have not changed a bit. Seriously? <laughs> not changed a bit? Are you kidding me? And then I think Patty had a caption on the engagement picture. She said yes. And I don't plan on asking her again. Okay, I got one. Yes, I take that and went with it. You know, some uh, uh, 46, 47 uh, years ago. So uh, thank you again for joining in with us this morning. Uh, we're glad to have you. Uh, hello to the Journey class. Linda, why don't you say hello to your ladies? Hi, ladies. Miss you. Well, as Linda and I said every week, uh, we started this class because I wanted to stay in touch with the Journey class and Linda wanted to stay in touch uh, with the Women with Purpose class. And that's what we've attempted to do. And we think technology has certainly helped us to do that. And then frankly, we're so gratified that so many others of you who are not uh, as a part in the Journey class, typically when we meet on campus or in Linda's class as well, uh, you've uh, been shared with or you've heard and you've joined us. And we're just delighted to have you as a part of, uh, of this experience. So uh, welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us. Again, comments are needed and appreciated and all read when the broadcast uh, is over. So thanks for joining us today. Last week, we began uh, a series, I'm not sure how long it's going to go, uh, looking at some selected Psalms. Last week, we looked at Psalm 62, God and God alone. Today, we look at Psalm 73. So get your Bible out. Uh, we're, we're not going to read all of it because it's a lengthy psalm, I think 28 verses. But as Linda and I teach through the psalm, we will be reading the verses that we're making comments on as we walk our way through this very powerful uh, uh, psalm. psalm. In February of 2008, the unthinkable uh, happened to our family. Our oldest son took his life. It was just simply uh, uh, unimaginable. It was uh, for family and for uh, friends and those who knew Jeremy, it was just simply a, a devastating time. But it also uh, became a time for me, I can only speak for me, where my faith, faith really uh, of many years, uh, was tested more than it had ever, ever been tested. I remember the night that, that uh, Jeremy passed and uh, my senior pastor, uh, Pastor David, uh, said to me, just the two of us, he said to me, he said, Jimmy, you're fixing to find out if what you've been teaching all these years is what you truly believe. And I've never forgotten that, that statement. Every year uh, I get a word for the year. Just kind of pray on it, think on it, study about it. That year, 2008, my word was grace. Who'd have thought that six weeks into the year, the unimaginable and the unthinkable, the most tragic thing would happen. And that really began a journey for me that lasted approximately 18 months through all of 2008. And then in 2009, and some of you will remember, I, I taught uh, on my word for that year, being very open and transparent, it was doubt. That was my word for 2009. And through that year, uh, it, was, it was a difficult journey in many, many ways as a Christian, especially as a Christian leader. 
But toward the end of 2009, uh, uh, things really just became together. Things that I had always thought and believed became clearer and more, uh, more confident in those as well. And I remember in 2010, my word for the year was courage. But there was a journey in there of about 18 months that was really, really a struggle. And I don't think I'm the only one that goes through that. Uh, I think the uh, struggle was a struggle with an age-old question that Asaph, who is the writer of our Psalm 73 today, I think it's one that he struggled with uh, as, uh, as well. And here is, here's the question. Why do, why do good things seem to happen to people who don't love God, don't know God, don't want to walk with God, some who are even uh, evil, some who are even uh, atheists, some who even hate God? Why does it seem that when you look at life that in most of those instances, those people experience uh, the good things in life and then on the other side of that coin, there are those who know God and who love God and are trying to do their best to walk with God and in my case, to help others to do the same and why do hardships and tragedy and suffering and difficulty come into their lives? So those were the questions that Asaph struggled with and what we're going to look at today in our time together. In the opening verse, in the opening verse, we get clearly what Asaph believed was most important, what he knew and what was most important to him. And let me read these opening four words because they are profound. And I really know it describes where I was uh, at the early part of that 18 month journey uh, after the dating tragedy. Asaph writes these words, truly, God is good. That's where he starts. This is what he knew. This is what he believed. Truly, confidently, certainly, absolutely, maybe beyond a shadow of a doubt. And he makes two great affirmations of faith. First, God is. I know God is. He's real to me. He was real to Asa. This is real to me and Linda and so many others who walk through us in, this, uh, in, the, in that difficult time. So he affirmed that, that God uh, exists and that he is. But even more profoundly, he explained to us one of the most important things about the character of God. He said, truly God is good. When Asaph looked at his life, and Asaph was... Uh, I think a contemporary with David, and he was a, uh, was a, a singer, a songwriter, and perhaps a musician, which is what David was as well, uh, prior to the building of the temple and the Ark of the Covenant. My guess is he and David, probably good buddies, they had similar uh, interest along the way, especially in, the, in, uh, in music and, uh, and musical instruments as well. And Asaph, he, 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 he looked at the world around him, and he remembered all of God's faithfulness through the years to the nation of Israel. And he came to the conclusion that God is good. But yet when he looked, when, when, when he observed uh, all that was going on around him, and I don't know exactly what that was, he writes in the next two verses, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Asaph knew what he believed. But when he looked around him and he saw how well off uh, uh, the wicked, wicked doesn't necessarily mean evil, it just means those. Who, uh, who ignore God and have no interest in God. They can be evil. They can be agnostic and atheistic and, and antagonistic toward God. But that's not all, all true. Just not a heart for God in any way, form, or fashion. And when he looked at them, he saw how well it was for them. And he was envious of that. It bothered him and brought him to this serious problem that was in the depths of his soul and, and in mind during those 18 months. Why does it seem that God treats those who don't know him and love him at times better than he treats his own children? I mean, it just, why live the Christian life 
Uh, why make the sacrifice? Why try to be pure? Why try to walk in holiness and obedience if this is the way that God treats his children? So this was a deep journey and a struggle both for me and I think for many of you who are watching. And Asaph had that same struggle as well. Linda, why don't you pick up in verse 4 and take us a little bit deeper into the psalm. Yes, he in these next verses is going to really survey the problem, tell us what he saw and what he was feeling and what he saw. And the first thing he observed really was the easy life of the difficult of uh, the uh, people that didn't love God. I mean, the first thing he saw in verse 4 and 5 were that they were, were prosperous. Their life was comfortable and easy. Verse 4, there, there are pains in their death. Their body is fat. And I think many of us are going for fat today, but when Scripture talks about somebody being fat, they mean that they are wealthy and prosperous. They have all the money that they want to buy the food that they want to eat. So they have the opportunity to be fat. They are not in trouble as other men nor are they plagued like mankind. So these people just appear to have an easier life, and it's frustrating him. Then he observes that they are proud. Sometimes they're arrogant. Sometimes they use their position of power to oppress others. Verse 6, therefore pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eyes bulge from fatness. The imagination of their heart run riot. They mock and speak of oppression. They speak from from high. And he just looks at that and says, and still they get blessed. And then even more, they don't love God. In fact, they may be mocking God. First design 10, 11, and 12, they have set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue parades through the earth. Verse 11, they say, how does God know? Is there knowledge with the Most High? In other words, I can do what I want to do. God doesn't seem to be bothered by it. Either he doesn't exist, he doesn't care, or he's inept and can't do anything about it. And then he wraps it up with this observation. Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease, and they have increased wealth. And then he compares that to his own situation. Again, we don't know what it was, but it must have been difficult. For he says in verse 13 and 14, Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure, for I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. It's like I comparing myself to them and I got the short end of the stick and I love God. I don't get it. And again, like Jimmy said, he had those thoughts, those feelings, and I think we all have from time to time. And, you know, we're not the only ones. Uh, there are many godly men in Scripture who had those same doubts and concerns. Even Job, who we really get the poster child of somebody getting dumped on, and handling it pretty well, at one point asked God in Job 21, 7, why do the wicked still live, continue on, also become very powerful? Even David in Psalm 37 tells us twice, don't fret because of the wicked. Don't fret because of the evil men that prosper, which tells us he had fretted and he had wrestled with that question and he is advising us against it. And then we come to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was pretty out there in his questions for God. I mean, he did immense words against God. In Jeremiah 12, verse 1, he said, Righteous are thou, O Lord, that I would lead my case with you. Indeed, I would discuss matters of justice with you. Why has the way of the wicked prospered? Why are all those who deal in treachery at ease? He started pointing fingers at God. He says, you have planted them. They have also taken, they grow, they have even produced fruit. And then when he looks at his own life, when he gets to Lamentation 3, he is just livid with God. He says, God has besieged and encompassed with bitterness and hardship. And then for 20 verses, he lists, you know, I still got gravel in my cheeks from that cistern experience. And I became the laughing stock of all my people when you put me out there like this. He is really frustrated with God. And he makes a statement. My soul has been rejected from peace. I have forgotten happiness. Here is a man that says, I don't even remember what it feels like to be happy. My life has been so difficult. So he states, my strength has perished. And so has my hope from the Lord. And it's a backup. That again, he doesn't mind putting it right out there and telling God what he thinks and questioning him. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2, he says, How long, O Lord, will I call for help and you don't hear? 
I cry out to you violent, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. This is particularly perplexing to Habakkuk because in thir verse 13, he says to God, Hey, I know that your eyes are too pure to approve evil. And you cannot look on wickedness with favor. And so then he says, so it doesn't make sense, God. So he asked him, why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? And then we come to Judges chapter 6 and Gideon. And he may have just put it out there in the simplest question. The angel shows up and he says, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And Gideon had two thoughts. B, you got the wrong man, and I'm going to explain that to you in a minute. But A just kind of spills out of his mouth. If God is for us, then why has all of this happened to us? He just doesn't understand. Neither did Asaph. So let's go back to Asaph and see if we can figure out some resolution to why God would allow all this to happen. You see, Asaph has find himself, finds himself now at a crossroads. He's in what I would call a crisis of belief. As he looks back, he knows his theology and what he believes about God. He has declared that God is good. But when he looks around and he sees the prosperity of the wicked, he is envious. When he looks within, he is in turmoil. He has lost his peace like Jeremiah. And he's beginning to wonder, did I make a mistake in trusting God? Mm -hmm obeying God. But finally, finally, he looks up. He does make a turn, doesn't he? You know, I find some uh, comfort, honey, I do, uh, in knowing that these, uh, 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 these biblical characters uh, are, are so real and so human mm -hmm. and, and, and struggle uh, with uh, uh, this really important question. I know you had said to me earlier, uh, how we respond and answer this question really has implications for our worldview mm -hmm. and for the lens in which we see uh, everyone and, and, and all of and, and what happens uh, to us. So he had spent uh, Asaph, uh, you know, much of those opening verses just looking, observing uh, the uh, apparent prosperity of those who no interest in the things of God at all. And then he looks at his own life and says, it's not worth it, okay? I'm getting a shot of the stick here. This is how God treats his children. I don't know that I want to uh, uh, trust him as my Lord and my Father. So when we come to verse uh, 15 and toward the end of the chapter, as Linda said, things things begin to, to, to turn. I, I, I won't say the problem is solved as much as the tension between what he believes and what he observes is better managed when he gets when he gets a, 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 a rude uh, perspective about his life. So let me pick up in verse uh, 15. Asaph uh, uh, writes, in fact, in verse 15 uh, and 16, he really tells us what not to do. Don't do this. Don't do this when he kind of questions and doubts. And he says, if I had said, I will speak thus, I would have been untrue to the generation of thy children. I think what he's saying is that, you know, in order, I had all these doubts. I did. Doubts were arising when I was looking at what was going on around me. But I didn't take those doubts to your children. I didn't take those doubts to fellow, uh, to fellow uh, believers, fellow Jews. I, I, I didn't do that because uh, perhaps they were weaker. Perhaps they wouldn't have understood. Perhaps it would even cause them to stumble. If me, as, as at least as a spiritual leader in worship, uh, it might have caused them in their own faith. So I didn't go to them. So, you know, having these questions are okay. I just do think we, we need to be careful where we take them. And then the next thing he says, but when I thought, I had to understand this, this dilemma, uh, this perplexity to me. It seemed to me a wearisome task. In other words, the more I tried to resolve this between what I know is true that God is and that he is good and what I'm observing in the world, the more it just drains me and wears, wears me out. 
So what can I do? Well, verse 17 is the turn. Until, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. Truly, thou dost set them in slippery places. Thou dost make them fall to ruin. How thou are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. On awakening, you despair, despise excuse me, their fathoms. When he got into the, 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 the presence of God, he, he remembered what I think he already knew. Sometimes I don't need new revelation in my life from God's word. I need to be reminded of what I know to already be true, that at least in this season, I forgot it. You see, he was, Asaph was walking by sight. Let me, let me go back again. Let me go back again to verse 3. For I was in of the Arab when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. We're always going to find ourselves on shaky ground when we live by sight and not by faith. Because faith in what we already know and what already has been proven true by God and His goodness is the thick ice. It is solid ground. Even if everything we see seems to go against it, we stand on the solid ground of what has proven to be true all the way through. When we walk by faith, we really begin to find out and to see the things that are true and of, of uh, most importance in value is what he's saying. He's saying, listen, those who don't know God, those who don't love God, those who do not trust God, they don't necessarily have to be wicked in an evil or sinful sense or even hate God. Those that are not in a relationship with God, God says they have their end. It is uh, scary. Uh, it's slippery. Uh, they fall into ruin. They're destroyed. They're swept away. They're terrorized. And verse 20, it's like, uh, it's like, it's like, like having a, a dream uh, that uh, what they had thought and believed all their life uh, uh, was true. And then they come to their dream and realize that it's not true. And they wake up and the dream has become a nightmare that's become reality. It's a frightening, frightening scene. You see, the, the point is, is all... All who ignore God, it, it may seem like they have an easier time, as it were, on the path of life. It may seem that way, but we need to remember the path they're on is headed in the wrong direction. You know, when we, when we look at them and we, we see uh, uh, prosperity and wealth and, and, and health and, and abundance and things... Uh, are at ease, but they don't have God. And when you don't have God, you really don't have anything. Because as Thomas said last week, it's God and God. Um, but let me let me read on. Just to make a turn, when my soul was embittered, and not only was he envious, not, not only was he jealous of what of the good things that were happening uh, uh, to those who didn't know God. He was resentful. He was embittered by it. He'd gotten to the point. Maybe even angry at God as a result of it. And I love this phrase because it's life-changing. When I was pricked in my heart, when I was convicted in my mind, he realized, wait a minute, I, I, I'm not thinking right here. God is, and he is God. I'm thinking, look at the next verse. I I was stupid and ignorant. I was like a beast toward thee. I was thinking like an animal who can't know you and love you and trust you and observe your goodness. And yet I had known, loved, and trusted your goodness all the days of my life. And I began to walk by sight and my faith. So what does he do? Look at verses 23 and 24. Really powerful. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. An assurance that no matter what we see, no matter how antithetical it may be to what we believe, God is with us. Next he says, you do hold me to your right hand. 
You protect me. Next, you guide me with your counsel. You guide me. You show me the way. I love this last one. And afterwards, you will receive me into your glory. You will give me honor and, and receive me into your glory. A promise of being with him forever. So he comes back to the realization. It's not about them and what they have. It's about me and who I have. Verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is nothing upon earth. Nothing. Not wealth. Not health. Not abundance. Nothing on earth that I desire besides thee. What am I, I don't need popularity. I don't need fame. I don't need financial security. As long as I have you. My flesh and my heart may fail. Yes, I struggle at times when I look at the things around me. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion ever. He made the turn and came back to the roots that he knew all along. That all he ever really needed was God. So Linda, we, we spent, you know, 20, 25 minutes here wrestling these two questions, uh, why do good things happen to those who don't love God? And why do, it seems, things that are not so good happen to people who do love God? So why do they happen? Why do good things happen to people who don't love God? Well, before I comment on that, could I just say, Jeremiah had the same resolution. You know, we left him in the despair, giving up hope. And he says, this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. The hinge pin of him changing from as low as he could get was to go back and recall God's goodness. Yeah. His and you know, I think, are new every morning. Great yeah. is thy faithfulness. This great right. this affirmation of faith is what flipped him and brought him back. So it's where you're yeah. focused. And Gideon came there as well. Mm -hmm. And Job came mm -hmm. there as well. All came back to that same rock-solid conclusion. God is good. Okay. Honey, why is God so kind and merciful to well, the, those who don't know him and love him? Well, because he loves them. That's what we've got. We, you know, we kind of think he must love me more than them because I'm so good and so bad. And yet God's love is consistent and faithful. He loves everyone the same. Jesus died for everybody. And so it's because God loves the people that don't care about him, the people that are cursing him, pushing him away, the people that are wicked. He loves them just as much. And what he's trying to do is to show them how much he loves them. He wants them to know him and to spend eternity with him. So Romans 2, 4, I think, really shows us why God is allowing good things to happen to bad people. Because, verse 4 says, Or do you think lightly of the riches, kindness, and forbearance, and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God would you to repentance? God is being kind and loving because he wants to draw those people to himself. Second Peter tells us that as well in 3 9. It says, God is patient. And in his patience, he's pouring out love and kindness to get people's attention. Not willing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So he's doing that because he loves them. So when we look and we see God's patience and mercy and kindness to those who don't know him, some who even hate him. It's, it's, it's God's effort in his love to draw them to himself and recognizing that he is the giver of all good gifts. Well, what about the other side of that coin, that question, and that is why do uh, hard things like Jeremy's passing, why do difficult, terrible things happen to people who know God and, and who love God? Uh, why, why is that uh, the case? Well, let me read verse 27 and 28, back Psalm 73. For lo, those who are far from God shall perish. Thou dost put an end to those who are false to thee, but for me. It is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all thy works. You see, when terrible, difficult, hard uh, things happen, to good people, people who love God, who know God. What's going on? 
God picking on them because they're his children? No. But he is allowing life to happen in a, in a fallen world. And when those difficult things fall on us, there's a whole world out there of family and friends and co-workers and neighbors who are watching. Watching what? They're especially watching those that they, at least, who say that they're Christians, who say they believe in God, who say that their God is good, and yet this happens. And how we respond. You see, we can't control life circumstances like this pandemic going on right now, we can only control how we respond. So we need to stay on that bedrock that God is and that God is good. And that realizing even in the difficult circumstances of life that make no sense as we look by sight is that we walk by faith. And we know God is and that God is good. So let me go back. Let me go back and read uh, verses 2 and 3 and then verses 27 and 28 again. Early on, Asaph writes, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was easily arrogant when I saw the prosperity wicked. Verse 27 and 28. For lo, those who are far from thee shall perish. Thou dost pen to those who are false to thee. But for me it is good near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge. I may tell of all of thy works. Did the situation change? No. Asaph did. And that's what needs yeah. to happen. I hope you'll ponder on this. is a very age-old uh, question that so many struggle with today, uh, especially believers. And I hope our time together has been helpful to you. Next week, we're going to look at Psalm 78. One of my favorite psalms, some verses in that, verses in that Psalm 78. Let me remind you, uh, journey group leaders, that we'll meet tomorrow night for our uh, weekly Zoom meeting to encourage and to challenge one another. Love you guys. Lynn and I love you so much. Have a great week, and Lord willing, we'll see you next Sunday morning. Bye-bye. Yeah.